Hi, good morning everyone. So my name is Song. I'm presenting the crystal arthropsy today. Um, so crystal arthropathies are the caused by the deposition of various minerals in the joints and soft tissue, uh, which leads to inflammation of the joints. Um, the most common types are, are sort of listed above. So there's gout, pseudogout, um, BCP, and calcium oxalate arthritis, which I'll focus on the um, top two today, uh, with gout being the accumulation of monosodium urate crystals and pseudogout being the calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate um, deposition disease. <laughs> Starting with gout, um, so gout is the most common form of infl inflammatory arthritis. So there is a prevalence of about 4 to 7% Australians that's ever had gout. Um, this is the latest data. Um, and particularly in elderly males, and this prevalence can be up to 7.5 to 10%. Uh, and every, um, so four out of five people that affected are males. Um, it, it causes um, a negative economic impact, you know, through affecting, um, you know, work absence and causing functional disability of patients. It's commonly associated with um, metabolic disorders, so diabetes, um, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and CKDs. There is an increase in prevalence, which is thought to be correlated with the increased level of obesity in the community. It does um, associate with increased all-cause um, cardiovascular mortality as well. Um, so in terms of pathogenesis, um, uric acid is a, a product of metabolism of purine. Um, uh, so the accumulation of monosodium urate crystals uh, extracellularly is, is the um, cause of this presentation of this disease. It normally occurs in um, avascular tissues, so such as cartilage, tendon, tendon sheath, um, ligaments in bursas, uh, skin, and tissue, soft tissues. And uh, in severe cases, this can occur in you know, large central joints, uh, sometimes the spine, but also parenchymas of organs such as kidneys. Um, so briefly speaking, so it, it or originated from hyperuricemia um, um, uh, with a you know supersaturation uh, you know with the reduced solubility uh, and crystal growth, um, the crystal precipitates in the joint space. Um, certain certain factors can affect uh, this process, such as you know temperature, pH, uh, concentrations of other ions and also, you know, individual sort of um, autoimmune um, uh, factors. Uh, some people have antibodies. Um, the crystal deposition itself doesn't really cause the disease per se, but it's more the inflammatory response associated, so such as the phagocytosis of the crystals um, by monocytes and synovocytes, which triggers the um, inflammatory response causing interleukin-1 production and activation of the LRP3 inflammasomes. Uh, which triggers the cascade of um, inflammatory responses with release of cytokines, adhesion molecules, and chemotactic agents. And this all causes the inflammatory presentation that we see in hospital. Uh, generally speaking, the infl inflammation itself is actually self-limiting. Um, and in between of the acute flares, uh, tophi can continue to enlarge, which is also uh, facilitated by the um, inflammatory response with the uh, macrophage um, activity and causing erosion of bones and cartilage, which causes the chronic um, problem. So the, there's four stages of the clinical manifestation of gout. Uh, so with the stage one being largely asymptomatic, um, which can actually um, sort of um, happen over 10 to 30 years, um, depending on the lifestyle of the patient and other metabolic factors. And the stage two is usually what we see them first uh, with the gout flare, uh, with elements of the inflammation, so pain, redness, uh, warm swelling, and disability. So patients usually have reduced range of motion of the joint. Um, so it tends to occur overnight to early morning, so between, let's say, tw uh, midnight to 8, 8 a.m., and uh, the, the, the pain and inflammation peaks um, over the next 24 hours and uh, settles down uh, days to weeks. Um, usually the most common is the first MTP joint um, as, the, as the single joint flare, um, but it can affect other joints as well as listed, uh, including ankle, wrist, fingers, and also bursas, even spine. 
And sometimes the, the inflammation can be quite severe, which extends to um, other uh, surrounding areas, um, which appears as dactylitis or, or, you know, almost like cellulitis. In severe cases, the skin and discrim discrimination can occur. Um, sometimes, as the first flare, a polyarticular gout can happen, but it's it's a mm, it's a less common pattern, but most mostly in patients who are a bit more sick and uh, in hospitalized patients. Uh, and when th when that presents, it can mimic sepsis uh, with temperature and um, constitutional symptoms. Um, and stage three of gout is the intercritical gout, which happens um, between the acute flares. Um, so this is actually early in the disease course. Um, this can be completely asymptomatic, which makes gout um, quite identifiable because it's not common in the course of arthritic um, disorders that pain will completely go away and patient become asymptomatic. Um, usually if the patient is not treated, they will have the second flare um, within two years time. And um, about stage four is a chronic arthropathy stage where there is a tophaceous uh, gout uh, with a chronic continued deposition of the uh, uric crystals in soft tissue causing, causing bone erosions um, and the destructions in the surrounding soft tissue. So tophies uh, appear as yellow white color, which is palpable, visible, uh, not painful, tender, and uh, can be found in long tendons, bursas, or in um, structures such, such as the ears. Um, the complications can be also associated with gout, uh, which um, just uric acid may crystallize in the renal pelvis, causing um, kidney stones. And also, um, uh, it's also associated with um, nephropathies, which I thought is the accumulation of the crystals in the parenchyma. I'll just briefly mention the differential diagnosis, mostly because septic arthritis is a very important differential diagnosis or concurrent diagnosis with gout, uh, which has to be explored. Um, otherwise, other things are just various forms of other sort of arthritic disorders. Um, so with investigations, so first of all, the blood uh, will show a neutrophilic leukocytosis with elevated ESR and CRP. Um, however, the serum uric acid level may actually be normal, high or low, um, during an acute flare. So it's not, compl it's not really indicative. The best time to test it is two weeks after. Uh, you may see some associated renal impairment. And sometimes, I guess the medics may want to do 24-hour uric acid to, um, to look for the causes. And the diagnosis um, is achieved through the synovial aspiration, the analysis of the fluid, for looking for um, needle-shaped negative by refrigerant um, crystals under the polarized light microscopy, which appears yellow. Well, there's a later slide that comes up will show the color. Um, and usually with the joint aspiration, there will be um, elevated looks, leukocytes um, in, in, the, in the fluid. And the fluid will also be sent for MCS to differentiate or diagnose for a concurrent or um, uh, septic arthritis. Um, in terms of imaging, so various imaging can be used, um, x-rays, ultrasound, um, MRI, uh, or new um, dual energy computer tomography. Um, so I'll speak uh, about x-ray in more details. Um, the ultrasound shows something called a double contour sign. Basically, um, there is accumulation of the crystals um, uh, over the highly cartilage, which causes an additional line um, uh, on top of the bony contour. So that shows the double contour sign. Um, and the stew energy um, computer tomography is used when aspiration is not pra practical, such as there's very low levels of infusion uh, or the joint is very deep. Uh, or otherwise, when there's a very high clinical suspicion of gout, but the aspirate is actually negative for the crystals. As just some features, um, so Tophi is the deposition of uric crystals as a soft tissue, in a soft tissue, and it's usually paraticular on the extensor surface, uh, maybe intraticular or associated with joints. Um, themselves are actually not radio opaque, it's the calcium precipitation that's associated with the extended appearance. And there is the punctured lesion, uh, which is sporadic, asymmetric, and uh, has the sclerotic border due to the indolent process. And um, the tophus can also be um, 
intraosseous, uh, which appears as a link occlusion. Um, and uh, there is that uh, sclerotic overhang edges, uh, which I think it's because of the chronicity plus the ongoing bone remodeling um, causes that appearance of the sclerotic uh, overhang edges. And another thing is um, um, with gout, there's usually preserved joint space until very late in the disease course because it's usually one, uh, one side, so the extensor side of the joint space that's affected. So on the x-ray, it appears that the joint space is maintained because the flex aspect is actually preserved. And there's no periarticular osteopenia as appears in things like rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, there's actually a picture of that uh, dual imaging CT scan, uh, which just has different uh, energy level uh, uh, x-rays that's absorbed uh, at different level by different structures soft tissue versus the crystal structure uh, so it can be reconstructed and um, um, demonstrate um, yeah the um, a, a disease part of the um, of the area um, for the management of gout um, so there is uh, mostly non-operative and the goal in the acute setting is to provide symptom relief and in the intercritical period is to um, as prophylaxis or as um, um, uh, uh, long-term disease modifying. So in the acute setting, uh, um, so NSAIDs, prednisolone and clotrazin or local corticosteroid injection. And in the inter intercritical period, uh, we can consider urate low uh, lowering therapy, that's ULT, uh, with the first line being allopurinol. And uh, uh, Febuxostat is the second line. Um, so this should be started um, after the acute phase. And also um, flare prophylaxis can be considered um, in specific cases. And usually it's uh, colchicine or prednisolone or um, NSAIDs are used. There are other, um, uh, other um, disease uh, medications as well. So interleukin inhibitors and ACTH, which um, are just definitely specialized initi uh, initiations for those medications. Another important thing is um, the risk factor management uh, in terms of um, reviewing the drugs for any diuretics, such as you know, furizomide um, newly started can potentially trigger the event. Uh, modifying diets, avoid the red meat, um, shellfish, increase water intake, avoid alcohol and sugary drinks. Um, and another part is the management of comorbidities of diabetes, hypertension and uh, CKD and skin heart disease, um, which uh, would uh, change the, alter the metabolic state of the body, which may help as well. And uh, um, when the patient develops um, arthritic changes um, or severe joint destructive um, uh, cases related to gout, uh, operative management can be considered for removal of tophi joint fusion or replacement um, in these cases. Um, um, so now I will just briefly discuss um, the calcium paraphosphate dihydrate crystal deposition disease, which is a mouthful, the CPPD uh, is the common name or pseudogout. Um, so the prevalence is actually quite high with this, with the, a spectrum of the disease of CPPD, um, mostly affecting the elderly, and actually up to uh, half of the adults uh, will have some radiographic features of, of this um, spectrum of CPPD by the age of 80. And the pathogenesis is um, the deposition of the CPPD crystal. Uh, which can occur in synovium, um, ligaments, tendons, or articulate cartilage. Uh, the, the actual cause is not very clear, but it's known to be associated, again, with metabolic disorders, um, and surgery as a trauma can also trigger an event. Um, so when the crystals are deposited in the fibrocartilage uh, in the joints, uh, it's called chondrocarcinosis. And um, uh, with the small crystals start shedding um, from the cartilage into the joints, and that's where a flare of pseudogout occurs. Um, once again, um, there is small crystals inside the joints. Phagocytosis activation of the inflammatory cascade is very similar to gout.
The clinical manifestation has got a spectrum. So there's once again, there's an asymptomatic stage, acute stage, and also chronic stage. So the asymptomatic stage is the chondral calcinosis, which is, um, I think there's a radiographic appearance, but there's no symptoms at this stage. And uh, when we see the patients, it's usually the acute stage, and that's the commonly known pseudo gout. Um, the presentation is very similar, so uh, acute inflammation, but with the most commonly affected joint being the knee, uh, up to 50%. And um, it also tends to, can affect uh, upper limb joints, um, so wrists, shoulders, uh, elbows. Um, it is, once again, self-limiting. It can be associated with um, osteoarthritis. And in elderly patients, it can have constitutional symptoms. Um, the, in the chronic uh, manifestations, there is something known as pseudo-rheumatoid arthritis, uh, where the symptoms of the disease mimic a rheumatoid arthritis. So there is the joint stiffness, um, pain in multiple joints, and that chronic inflammatory response. Uh, it can be also superimposed with osteoarthritis, and it also have um, some sometimes presentation almost similar to a charcoal um, uh, arthropathy uh, with pseudo neuropathic joint disease. Although there is no actual neuropathic aspect to it, but um, the joint destruction um, is similar. And in terms of investigation, once again, it has neutrophilic leukocytosis. Um, there's some other targeted biochemical screening that we can do, and mostly. Uh, looking for the biochemical or metabolic disturbances that could potentially be associated with um, pseudo gout. Um, yep, that's listed. Uh, so this is the uh, joint fluid aspiration. We'll demonstrate positive biorefrigerant rhomboid crystals, uh, which when they say weakly positive biorefrigerant, they mean it appears blue. And uh, so the gout uh, crystals are near like that it appears yellow. Um, and our imaging, once again, there are some specific ultrasound signs, uh, actually somewhat similar to the previous gout appearance. And there are some hyperechoic either um, regions or nodules or lines that's sort of indicating that there is crystal deposition. And on the x-rays, um, it says chondrocalcinosis, which appears as a cartilage calcification. So there's mineralization of the cartilage inside the joint, which appears as a small sort of density, linear density. Um, there, you might also say uh, you may also see degenerative changes because it's commonly associated, such as in the picture on green. And the treatment of um, pseudo gout is actually somewhat similar to uh, gout in terms of acute attack um, with NSAIDs um, and intraarticular injections and corticosteroids. Um, in the chronic cases. Um, such as in the pseudo rheumatoid arthritis, the medicine is actually quite similar to RA, uh, with the, the, the third line being actually mm, disease modifying drugs such as methotrexate. Um, and uh, the, yeah, with OA and uh, sort of pseudo neuropathic disease, um, this management is similar to the actual disease itself, so OA or childhood arthropathy. And I think that's probably all I have, and there's just um, some key points as septic arthritis is a very important differential diagnosis and in acute attack. Um, the management is NSAIDs, colchicine, um, glucocorticoids, um, and manage the associated comorbidities, and allopurinol will be the first line in acute management, uh, in the, uh, after the acute phase. And uh, a gout can also flare despite the starting of therapy, because the fluctuation of the urate level um, might trigger uh, a reaction to the toe thigh in the system. Um, thank you. Sorry, it's a little bit over time.